Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I want to start by thanking you for coming here today. Again, we've been we've been blessed every year. I believe we've had a couple windy windy years, but um, God seems to bless us on this day when we want to honor our fallen. So we are here today to increase awareness of domestic violence and honor three of our brothers whose lives were taken in domestic violence related incidents. Domestic violence knows no social or economic boundaries. It exists in all segments of our population and no one is exempt from its influence. Relationships should be built on love and respect rather than intimidation and abuse. It is incumbent upon each of us to do our part in combating domestic violence. And I'm happy and proud that we as a community are standing together to fight it. Uh, so a little bit about Deputy Larry Griffith. He was born in Fargo, North Dakota in 1950. Moved to San Diego in 1956 where he was raised and graduated from Coronado High School. After high school, he enlisted in the United States Army. And when he left full-time military service, he joined the Army Reserve and served in that capacity until his death. In the late, late 1970s, Larry became a reserve deputy sheriff for Plumas County. Larry was eventually hired full-time by Plumas and served in that capacity for three years. Larry, Larry joined our office, the Lassen County Sheriff's Office, in 1984 as a deputy sheriff. Larry was always more concerned about family and friends than himself. He chose the law enforcement profession out of a strong desire to help people and ultimately lost his life while trying to help and protect a victim who could not protect herself. A tragedy struck Lassen County, the Lassen County Sheriff's Office, and above all the Griffith family on March 2nd, uh, 1995. When Larry was shot and killed while attempting to contact a suspect at the scene of a domestic violence incident. Larry, who was 44 at the time, had responded with three other deputies to a ranch house in the desert east of Ravendale. The suspect began shooting as the officers were exiting their two vehicles, and Deputy, Deputy Griff was fatally injured. We need to remember the sacrifice of Deputy Griffith, or that Deputy Griffith made on behalf of this community and our country, and continue to honor him and the other two officers we are recognizing today. Thank you again for joining us at this important event where we stand together against domestic violence and honor our fallen officers. Ladies and gentlemen, friends, family, colleagues, brothers, sisters, thank you for joining us on this day. Please bear with me as I try to pay respects and honor a man that I only knew in reputation, but it left a great impression, a great footprint upon my organization and this community. We're here today to talk to you about Officer Rob McElrath. When Officer Rob McElrath was born, he was a boy, a boy like the rest of us. And when he was born, he immediately became a son, a brother, a grandson, a nephew, and a cousin. As he started to grow, he became a classmate, a teammate, a best friend, a neighbor, and a graduate. As a man, he became a father, an uncle, a coach, a Marine, a police officer. I know from talking to his family and his friends that Rob also aspired to be two more things, a grandfather and retired. Instead, Rob became a martyr to domestic violence. Rob, Rob McElrath first served uh, in the United States Marine Corps becoming before uh, coming out and serving as a correctional officer with the Lassen County Sheriff's Department. Well, ultimately, he wound up with Susanville Police Department as a police officer where he served for a great number of years. He was loved by everyone and is a great counterpart. Rob was murdered in a domestic violence relationship. I didn't know Rob very well, so I had to ask a lot of questions from my members of my department about him to get some information so I could talk and try to give him the proper respects. And what I learned was it was well known by Rob, or by everyone in my department, that Rob struggled with domestic violence and he struggled with his relationship. He tried to maintain it, he tried to keep it working. What was not known by anyone in my department was how to help Rob and how to do anything about it. Sympathy does not solve domestic violence. We must all be advocates and, and be aware of a domestic violence and strive to prevent it. 
As the sheriff said, domestic violence knows no race, religion, color, class, profession, age, or gender. It's the responsibility of every single person to draw attention to the presence of domestic violence, and we must work together to bring it to an end. Not everyone caught in a domestic violence situation is able to um, act on their own behalf. Some of them may be trapped. That's why we must all be vigilant and be wary of domestic violence and its presence. When you see something, when you stand up, and you say something, and you do something, you may not just be helping someone, you may save a life. And I will leave by saying, reminding you of the words of Edward Burke, all that's necessary for the presence of evil is for good men to do nothing. Do something. Thank you. Hello everyone, Mike Poindexter, Mora County Sheriff, and I, first I just want to thank uh, our neighbors down in Lassen for inviting us. It's an honor to be here. Um, I'm going to date myself probably, but I, I worked down here when I was in my other life on the highway patrol for a while. Um, and I'm, I've had the unfortunate experience to have been serving in this area for all three of these tragedies. It's a very somber day for sure. Just eight days short of one year since we lost Deputy Jack Hopkins. And I'm gonna to refer to Jack as a as a boy because I'm an old guy and he was just a kid and he was taken from us much, much, much too soon. Um, as my colleagues said, uh, domestic violence is it knows no borders. Um, Jack was a great kid every day, every single day. I remember Jack's smile and I miss him. I wish we had him back. It was an especially hard day for me because we were so shorthanded that I was supposed to be the one handling all the calls that day and, and Jack was just, uh, there was a lull in the court calendar and he heard the call and out the door he went. Uh, very, very, very difficult time. Um, we can't thank you enough for letting us come down here and uh, for this honor. You know, uh, this line of work in the world we live in today is just crazy. I've been doing this almost 40 years and it's always been a hard time. And it's always been a tough job. I guess most of us that do it don't consider it a job, it's more of a calling. Jack certainly didn't get the opportunity to um, experience nearly as much of that as he should have. I'm going to read you a, oh, it's, it's a prayer, kind of. <laughs> you may not think it's a prayer about when I get done with it, but uh, it's by an unknown author, and I have uh, put a few changes to it personal changes, but the bottom line here is, at the end of it, the gist is, even the good Lord just doesn't quite know where we're at or how to, uh, what it takes to do this job these days. It used to be so easy for me to bring a young kid up, and God knows I I got several in my family that have followed my footprints, and it scares me. I used to be able to coax them along and help them along, and in good conscience, it's really difficult to do that. So, unknown author to this, and uh, little modifications on my part, and then I'll be finished. When the good Lord was creating peace officers, he was well into his sixth day of overtime when St. Michael, the patron saint of law enforcement, appeared and said, Sir, you're doing an awful lot of fiddling around on this one. And the Lord said, Have you read the specs on this order? St. Michael. A peace officer has to be able to run five miles through alleys in the dark, scale walls, enter homes the health inspector wouldn't touch, all while not wrinkling his uniform. He has to be able to sit all day on a stakeout, cover a homicide scene that night, canvass the neighborhood for witnesses, testify in court the next day. He must be a minister, a social worker, 
a diplomat, a tough guy, and a gentleman. He has to be in top physical condition at all times, running on black coffee and half-eaten meals. And he has to have six pairs of hands. St. Michael shook his head, six pairs of hands. The Lord looked at St. Michael and said, it's not the hands that are causing me problems. It's the three pairs of eyes. Did you say three pairs of eyes? The Lord nodded yes. One pair that sees through a bulge in a pocket before he, the officer asks, may I see what's in there, sir? When he already knows and wishes that he didn't. Another pair here in the side of his head for his partner's safety. And still another pair here in front that can look reassuringly at a bleeding victim and say, you'll be all right, ma'am, when he knows it isn't so. St. Michael said, Lord, get some rest. You can work on this tomorrow. I'm afraid I can't do that, said the Lord. I've just got to improve on the current model that we have now. This current model can talk a 250-pound drunk into a patrol car without incident, feed a family of five on a civil service paycheck. St. Michael circled the model of the peace officer very slowly. Can it think? He asked. You bet it can think, said the Lord. It can tell you the elements of a hundred crimes, recite Miranda warning in its sleep, detain, investigate, search, and arrest a crook on the street in less time than it takes five learned judges to debate the legality of the stop. And still, he keeps his sense of humor. The officer also has a phenomenal self-control he can deal with crime scenes painted in hell, coax a confession from a child abuser, comfort a murder victim's family, and then read in the daily paper how law enforcement isn't sensitive enough, sensitive enough to the rights of criminal suspects. St. Michael bent over and ran his finger across the cheek of the peace officer. It seems there's a leak, he pronounced. You see, sir, I told you. You're working too hard and putting too much time into this model. That's not a leak, said the Lord. It's a tear. What's the tear for? St. Michael asked. It's for bottled up emotions. It's for fallen brothers and sisters. It's for unconditional commitment to a solemn oath, the badge, and that funny piece of cloth called the American flag. You're a genius said St. Michael. The Lord looked at St. Michael with a somber face and said, I didn't put it there. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you again, all of you, for your presence today. Because your attendance really does give us great encouragement. As I prepared for these closing remarks, I wrestled with the questions. How does a sacrifice of these fallen officers impact us today and tomorrow and next week and next month and so on? How does something so tragic in the past impact us in the present and future? So going forward, here are my feeble answers 
to these soul-searching questions. First, we must continue our mission as a tribute to the fallen. Whether it's the mission of our law enforcement agencies or the mission of Lassen Family Services to end domestic violence and all forms of abuse in our community, or the mission of a minister who is called by God. Sheriff Poindexter, I could not agree more. It is a calling. A calling, that is something we all truly share today. We must press on in fulfilling our various callings. We must leave this place more motivated, more committed, more determined to fulfilling our mission and calling as a tribute to the fallen. Also, we must remember our fallen by the way we conduct ourselves, professionally and personally. The wreaths, the photos, the plaques, as meaningful and symbolic as they are, they are only material items. They serve to focus our memories, but the real honor is how we carry on. We must honor our fallen by the way we conduct ourselves, personally and professionally. Finally, we must remember our fallen in the way we serve. I truly believe our sorrow can make us a better community. I believe our righteous anger can be transformed into more justice and more peace. Perhaps we cannot match the sacrifices made by these three fallen men, but certainly we can try to match their sense of service. Perhaps we cannot match their courage, but surely we can strive to match their devotion. For example, volunteers are needed at Lassen Family Services. Volunteers are needed in our law enforcement agencies. Volunteers are needed in our schools. Volunteers are needed in our churches and places of worship. Volunteers are needed in agencies and organizations throughout our community. Blood donors are needed even today as we gather here. The Apostle John wrote in 1 John chapter 3, verse 18, let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and in truth. Remember the biblical story of the Good Samaritan? Martin Luther King Jr. insightfully showed the two different questions which were asked. The first question which the priest and the Levite asked was, if I stop to help this man, what will happen to me? But the Good Samaritan reversed the question. If I do not stop to help this man, what will happen to him? When you meet someone in need today, which question will you ask? These smoky skies are actually quite symbolic for us today. We will push back the darkness and clear blue skies will return to our communities as we continually reach out and help and serve others. There is that usual sense of hopelessness and despair that follows senseless violence. <coughs> Country singer Kane Brown performed in Las Vegas hours before the mass shooting on October 1st, earlier this month. He tweeted a four-word reaction to the shooting. This world is sick. A sentiment probably some of you may, might share today. <coughs> I love this. Someone responded, the world is not sick. One person was sick. One person does not represent the world at large. I couldn't agree more. That is exactly right. Like the police officers, including those off-duty officers attending the concert who shielded, who shielded citizens while people turned their trucks into makeshift ambulances, and military veterans treated wounds, we can become part of the solution rather than being a part of the problem. 
like one man who transported a wounded victim by wheelbarrow. We can be conduits of help and service. We can shine as lights rather than curse the darkness. We can help. We can serve. We can give. We can press forward with our mission as we better our communities. And we can pray. What better way to remember our fallen? Chaplain Jerry Vander Wendy, if you please come and lead us in our closing prayer now. God bless you. God bless the families of the fallen. And God bless all of you who serve and the families who wait and watch with you every day. Thank you. Bow your heads, please. May the grace and peace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.